Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Northern Territory. Uh, my Nuffield uh, topic is, can Australian barramundi be the whitefish equivalent to salmon? There we go. I'll start by, uh, by thanking my uh, sponsor, or my investor, Woolworths, uh, for their uh, financial backing of uh, this opportunity, and uh, Nuffield Australia and the uh, fantastic team with uh, Jody and Nicola and co. Uh, for all the uh, support and infrastructure that goes behind uh, supporting a Nuffield Scholar. It's an uh, amazing investment in, in human capital and uh, one that I'm sure uh, across all the different scholars you'll, you'll see uh, amazing returns to Australian ag. Uh, also to uh, Hump to Do Barramundi uh, for the, the, le giving me the time off and uh, my, my folks uh, Bob Richards and Julie Tyson uh, for all of their support and uh, my, my family Taryn and, uh, and the kids. It's, uh, it's been a big investment for everybody, but uh, it's been great. So who are we? Uh, we're fifth, we've got five generations uh, in the Northern Territory. Uh, I, my, my wife, Taryn, and I, you know, her great-grandparents were running around in the, in the North at the same time as mine were back around the time of the Great Depression. And uh, yeah, we've got lo long family history here in the Northern Territory, which is quite unusual in a, in a jurisdiction with a tr transient population. We've got three kids, uh, Isabel, Cameron and Alex, and, uh, and Taryn and I work uh, in Humpty Doo Barramundi with uh, my father, my stepmom Julie, and my brother Jim. So it's a family enterprise. So uh, Humpty Doo Barramundi, so Humpty Doo's purpose of being existing really is to produce beautiful Australian food and jobs and we achieve that by growing Humpty Doo Barramundi for Australia and the world. So uh, we're very much family owned. We grow uh, you know, now from a, a starting base of just uh, 300 kilos in our first year of production. We're now doing uh, you know, two to three million kilos of barramundi a year, which equates to four to six million um, meals of barramundi a year that's uh, you know, predominantly in the Australian domestic market. Uh, we employ 40 people, produce our fish uh, you know, 52 weeks a year. We harvest twice a, twice a week and send fresh barramundi all around Australia. So we're over two million fish on the farm. So what we do essentially is we grow baby barramundi from 0.05 of a gram up to five kilos and a range of sizes in between. So we've got quite a diversity of sizes that we sell different grades. But uh, so uh, you see that beautiful big boy up there. It's, uh, that's the, the key product at around the five kilos. Uh, and you can see the, the picture there, bottom left, is uh, our fish in Costco supermarkets. Um, we've really changed the way we're doing things recently. Every barramundi in Costco supermarkets in Australia comes from Humpty Doo. So it's a new thing, but something we're pretty proud of. So uh, we operate in a really amazing place, you know. We've got all sorts of wildlife, you know, from beautiful things like uh, wallabies and jabiru to more prickly things like saltwater crocodiles and death adders. But uh, it's, it's all part of the course in a normal day's farming for us, and it's an uh, you know, amazing part of the world. So my investigation really is a question of potential. You know, can Australian barramundi be the whitefish equivalent to salmon? You know, the, the, we've seen the global salmon industry reach astronomical growth, and uh, and we, not everyone wants to eat a pink fish. So it's the question of uh, is there a, you know is there a good candidate in barramundi to follow that up? So my study looked to identify the challenges and success factors required to make that that uh, development possible. So the situation as it stands at the moment is global salmon industry is 46 times larger than the global barramundi industry. Uh, the uh, domestic Australian barramundi production is, uh, is currently about 6,000 tonnes and looking to grow to about 10,000 tonnes over the next year. So that's 60% growth in the next two years. Uh, the ma majority of barramundi consumed in Australia is, uh, a lot of people wouldn't know, is actually imported and, uh, you know, without decent uh, country of origin labelling to tell, tell them where their food, where that seafood comes from. Uh, and consumers assume it's Australian, the research has shown. When you hear barramundi you think Australian, but the reality is that there's a lot of product coming in from Southeast Asia. So during my investigation, I travelled across 20 countries over 18 weeks, uh, went to R&D facilities, hatcheries, farms, factories, disease laboratories, uh, meeting with farmers, regulators, researchers and vet veterinarians. So I uh, tried to get a lot of coverage. I think in the end I've gone around the world about four times. Uh, but uh, there's so much to learn. So uh, there's some of the countries I visited. 
So along the way, uh, outside of just looking at fish farms and barramundi, uh, there was a lot of other lessons that we learned. So, uh, you know, really learn about scale and efficiency. Uh, during our, our GFP, we'll talk, talk about it a bit later, but uh, we went to, you know, the third biggest pineapple farm in the world. You know, they, they grow one and a half million kilos of pineapples every day. And, uh, produ and, and produce a million tonnes of cassava starch and then use the byproducts from those two industries to fatten 100,000 cattle a year. So just seeing operations operating that scale is ab absolutely mind-boggling. Uh, I went, and went to the largest barramundi farm in the world in Saudi Arabia and uh, they'd, they'd spent about $200 million setting up the largest uh, you know, operation. They could produce about 12,000 tonnes of barramundi, which is a, an awful lot of barra, but they could only sell about four. So, uh, and when, it, when they grew that fish, it cost them about $7 a kilo to produce, and they could only sell it for about $4. So, scale alone doesn't make profitability. You actually need to develop your markets, and I, I, that's where I saw was their, their, um, their key thing to l lessen out of that. Uh, Japan was amazing in terms of niche marketing. I mean, you, you went, we went to uh, a place where they're getting uh, $150 a kilo for, uh, for beef, like corn beef, basically, corn beef flakes. Uh, $15 a litre returned to the dairy farmer for making milk jam, which was sort of sweet and condensed milk, I think, but it was very nice. But, uh, <laughs> but it was, a, it was an, an innovation and an ama amazing marketing story. And, you know, $45 for rock melons when we just come from Indonesia, where, uh, you know, where those... Uh, those Pineapples were certainly cheap. Uh, oh, cotton. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Norway was a, was a case of a country that was just focused, just so focused on salmon. You know, they, uh, from, from the regulators to the, uh, the industry and the suppliers, just so, you know, focused on developing that salmon opportunity for their country. And it's absolutely massive, the largest producers of salmon. Uh, the Faroe Islands were, for me, a lesson in, you know, they're the lowest cost producers of salmon, even though in quite a remote location, but they were growing the right thing in the right place. So, uh, you know, they had just the right, the right water resources and the right temperature regime, and, uh, and also they, they put a lot of effort into the care of their juveniles, which was delivering much higher, you know, 40% increase in, uh, in yield off farm as a result of that extra care they were putting in, so massive stuff. In Mississippi, I learned about industry-driven research. The, uh, the, they've got a big cropping and grains industry there, and, but they're, they're quite far from a lot, of, uh, a lot of their markets. And so years ago, they did, a, did an exercise where they looked at what could they do to value add locally, and they came up with the channel catfish industry. And that's uh, two cartons. Um, <coughs> that's, uh, uh, the drinks are on to you tonight. <laughs> it's all right, <laughs> after this. Uh, so it was uh, amazing that they, they developed this industry out, you know, this uh, livestock industry out of, uh, out of uh, you know, looking at what the needs of the grain farmers were. And then the, so the government department there is still set up basically around looking at genetics and processing yields and farming systems to, uh, to add that value. So that was fantastic industry-driven research. So the framework I used uh, to undertake this investigation was an idea I came across at the um, Contemporary Scholars Conference in Ireland, and that was around genetics creates the potential, management realises the potential, and disease destroys the potential. And I thought that was a really neat, uh, neat framework to, uh, to look, at, look at this investigation around. So on with the question of genetics creates the potential. So barramundi are an incredibly hardy and versatile species. They can live in anywhere from freshwater billabong in the trop tropical north where they'll dry up and survive in a puddle. Uh, in Iowa, in the States, I went and visited a farm where they were growing in an intensive indoor research system, barn, uh, surrounded by snow drifts. So, so for a tropical species, that was pretty amazing to see that you know, they could be successfully growing fish and it can be grown in saltwater sea cages. So this is a sea cage farm in the Red Sea. So, uh, you know, it, it incredibly diverse, the country they can operate out of. So what we can see here is uh, the, the growth rate of different species. So the blue line up there is uh, barramundi, and where, the, where it intersects up there, that line is salmon. So to the point of harvest, the growth rate between barramundi and salmon is quite comparable. Uh, they are slower 
than species such as cobia or yellowtail kingfish, which are sort of off the chart in terms of their growth, although uh, maybe harder, harder species to market. Uh, but they, Barramundi compared very favourably with an awful lot of uh, you know, commercial species that are widely farmed around the globe. And that was something that I w wasn't really aware of. You know, I, I knew that Barramundi do what they do, but when I went and ha actually had a look and said, wow, they grow three times faster than a lot of these, uh, these other species that people are pretty happy about farming, it, it blew me away. So. Uh, there's other challenges of them though. So uh, they can suffer from melanisation. So it's, imagine it's like a fish getting a tan that goes right through into the flesh. So that top fish you can see there is a, a fish grown in a sea cage operation in, uh, you know, in Saudi Arabia and the fish at the bottom is uh, one of our fish. So you can see that they're quite different uh, you know, physical attributes of the fish just grown in, this, in a different environment. So uh, that does uh, you know, make it difficult to sell it under you know, one species because they're so different. Uh, they can have relatively low processing yields. So uh, th I took this picture. So um, barramundi have a very heavy bone structure and, uh, and a large head. So compared to a species like a salmon, there's a lot, more, you know, a lot lower fillet recovery. Uh, in this picture I took here, uh, that's of a Nepali guy in, in Saudi Arabia filleting fish. He was standing next to a $100,000 German-made filleting machine, which can you know, fillet one fish a second. But uh, in their situation, where they're only paying him $100 a week, it was uh, better, he would get a 3% better yield with a knife than the machine would. So uh, those economics stacked up for him to be standing there filleting that fish. Uh, he was very good, but uh, I don't think you'd get the same economics here in Australia where, uh, you know, labour costs are a very different story. So under the category of management, realise the potential. I'll talk about the Norway case study, which was pretty amazing for me. So the figures up the top there, uh, Norway in 1979 had essentially the same level of fish pro of production as the Australian barramundi industry has today. So, uh, you know, they've, they've now grown uh, 200 times that size. So I uh, thought it was good to see where they were and where we are now. Uh, the, the pie chart there shows that, uh, you know, Norway is highly focused on salmon. So 94% of their aquaculture production is uh, specifically on salmon. So, uh, as I say, they're you know, 200 times bigger than the Australian industry. It's got a 50-year history, so it's, it's very, uh, very mature. The, the Norwegian environment is similar to us in a lot of ways. You know, it's, it's, it's got, it's, it is very remote. It's high cost. You know, the, the, the cost of living and the cost of wages in Norway was you know, is higher than here. And very high tech. I thought very similar to us. So there are, we do have a lot of similarities. It's not like we're comparing it to Indonesia or somewhere which has an entirely different cost structure except they are highly focused. They have one species and one growing system that their whole government and industry is focused around. They have focused R&D, so they know that that's where their growth and their money is going to come from, so that's, where they, that's what they're investing in, learning about. And they have a National Aquaculture Act, which provides a framework for their whole industry to grow, which is something we don't have. Uh, in comparison, or in contrast, in Australia, our aquaculture industry is, relative, is relatively young and not so mature. Uh, that we have less coastal, coastal infrastructure along the north, so we have a huge coastline in the north of Australia, but uh, it isn't all that well serviced. Um, we have a multi-species focus, so you know where they're very focused on salmon. We've got salmon, barramundi, kingfish, abalone, you know, cobia, tuna, prawns, they, which are all quite significant industries in their own right. So that really has diluted the R&D uh, investment as well as. The, uh, you know, as well as investment dollars. So it's, uh, you know, being focused on one thing allows you to do well at it. Uh, we have varying state-based aquaculture regulations. So I don't know if, uh, you know, you guys who saw the presentation by Mark from Rabobank yesterday talking about uh, Pacific Reef uh, in Queensland. So they were going on to, you know, build an, another farm and uh, they were looking at a, quite an ambitious project in Queensland called the Gartholungra project and it took them 16 years to get uh, regulatory approval for that so I'm sure you can understand how that sort of regulation issues uh, can impact on the ability of an industry to grow. So barramundi issues, you know, 
fish grown with diverse growing conditions have quite uh, you know, diverse quality attributes. So a fish from a fresh water is not going to taste the same as a fish from the salt water. A fish from a, a shed is not going to look the same as a fish from a salt water pond. So you know, that, that's really going to lead to di attribute differentiation marketing where, where everyone will go out and market the benefits of their, uh, their growing system and the attributes of the product that it delivers. Uh, as Catherine mentioned earlier, you know, nationally there isn't any you know, country of origin labelling uh, in food service and research has shown that food service is where most Australians eat their seafood. So uh, if you can't tell you, you know, a lot of this, this, the you know, presentations in the last few days have talked about telling your story and that sort of thing. And uh, if you can't tell your story, you know, Australia is a high cost place to operate. If you can't actually differentiate on the basis of being Australian in our core market, it does make it a lot harder. And there's little to no value adding uh, of barramundi products. Most fish is going off farm in the whole form and uh, uh, you know, getting uh, you know, getting combined out in the market. So, in comparison to that, uh, in salmon, I, I took this in Tesco in Dubai. This picture and was just staggered by the uh, you know, mouth-watering range and branding of all the different products that they had. You know, in salmon and other species, uh, that really enabled you to make the product more consumer-friendly and to get your branding message through. Disease destroys the potential. I'm sure, uh, you know, disease is the number one cause of aquaculture farm failure, so it's uh, something that you, we, we can't ignore. Uh, a lot of you will be familiar with the, uh, the situation in, in the prawn industry in southeast Queensland, which has been decimated by the introduction of an exotic uh, prawn disease in white spot. And, uh, you know, basically all farming of prawns has ceased in that region, and they're looking really, and even in wild, wild stocks in that area, so they're really having to look very closely. And that was brought, you know, apparently brought in from imported product. Uh, I visited a farm <coughs> in Southeast Asia where they were affected by five different barramundi diseases that if they don't vaccinate their fish against, their fish all die. So, uh, you know, that was scared the pants off me. And coming from uh, an environment where basically we don't use antibiotics at all and we don't have to vaccinate our fish at all, uh, it was pretty scary for me to see that sort of stuff. So, that, you know, there, there has been a study conducted that identified there's at least five, uh, you know, key disease risks. Uh, the likelihood of those diseases uh, being introduced into the Australian industry is moderate. Uh, through the imported product, because if you've got a whole product coming, a whole fish coming in, it's not that hard, not that far a link to say that fish gets filleted and the fishmonger goes, oh, some, someone comes in, I want, have you got any crab bait? They put it in a crab pot, next thing you know, it's in the aquatic environment. And unlike uh, a lot of other things, you know, where, where our biosecurity has failed in bananas or in other species, where they could actually, it's an introduced species, they can just eliminate them all. Uh, in a native species that occurs in water, pretty hard to stop it once it's in. So that the, you know, the issues around biosecurity are really significant. Uh, the, the potential for these diseases, you know, once, once they come in, to destroy fishing, farming, recreation, indigenous uses of that fish resource are massive. So, and there's currently no disease kill step in that, uh, that fish. You know, he, I met with a vet a couple of weeks ago and he was explaining how he would freeze fish that he had, didn't have time to you know, finish the culture of the bacteria or, or viral infection. Uh, he'd freeze it and then he could defrost it later because it doesn't kill them, so you know that, that's really important to realise. So, <clears throat> recommendations that we as an industry can work on together, uh, you know, around regulation and R and D, industry marketing and biosecurity. So. If we look at uh, regulation R&D, I believe Australia would benefit from the development of a, a National Aquaculture Act to provide a common framework around the development of uh, aquaculture opportunities around the country. Uh, aquaculture is the fastest you know, uh, pro meat protein sector globally. So the fastest growing. Uh, focused R&D targeted, you know, targeting who they, the species that are likely to become the, uh, the big players like the salmon type scenario uh, and barramundi is a, a real contender there. Uh, an investment in genetic development to, to um, you know, develop the opportunities around the strengths of a species like barramundi while working on, uh, you know, tr treating the weaknesses around melanisation and fillet recovery. In marketing, uh, Australian barramundi quality standards, you know, the, the industry is working together on those, and that's really important to ensure that the consumer has a positive experience every time they eat the product, because if you get a variable 
variable quality product, uh, you know, you won't go back for it. I hope everyone enjoyed the Barramundi at the end of the other night, actually. Um, the industry marketing, uh, you know, once you're making sure that the, the product's right, that investment in industry marketing is, is, import, is, is required when we're looking at 60% in production growth over the next two years. Uh, and in de de development of uh, new products. So the product on the right up there was, uh, I took a picture of those two in, uh, in Dubai, but the product on the right is, you know, Scottish salmon with, with gold, leaf, gold leaf on it, you know. I mean, there's all sorts of amazing premium branding if you want to, and that we're getting well over $100 a kilo for that product. So uh, the product on the right was pretty expensive too, but without the gold on it. Um, so, and country of origin labelling. Obviously, to uh, you know, to protect that investment we make in marketing and the investment we make, and that that's a and in, that's a priority that's uh, important across the whole industry. So last week I was in Canberra with uh, the new Seafood Industry Australia uh, chairman and uh, and CEO, uh, lobbying fed, the federal government politicians around that, and they believe through the. Uh, you know, process that uh, Catherine's been working on that, you know, effective engagement with the food service trade to find a good outcome around country of, country of origin labelling is achievable. Biosecurity. So uh, a biosecurity assessment of all disease risks from imported product is necessary to ensure that the federal government, you know, can put the necessary controls in place. That sort of thing. But we don't really know that they're a risk. We say, well, we pretty well do, but they actually need to see it demonstrated in, in the right format for them to be able to go through the administrative process. Enhanced biosecurity at the national and farm level. Uh, I'll go forward one. This is uh, the Australian Barramundi Farmers Association uh, biosecurity working group and vets and national regulators working together last in, at our farm two weeks ago. They were up here to look at a uh, mutual obligation mutual obligations around uh, biosecurity. Uh, we need to make sure that they're stopping the, the diseases from coming in. And obviously, once there's anything in Australia, we need to be doing mon monitoring and management and biosecurity between farms. So, uh, and looking at inst instituting a kill step for all Barramundi imports so that we don't bring these diseases in. And the, the in investment in disease monitoring and vaccine development for diseases as they arise so that we, uh, we can target them. You know, we don't vaccinate our fish. It'd be a big expense, and which of the five diseases or others would you vaccinate for? It, you know, you don't know which one is, which one do you treat for? So in answer to the question, you know, can Australian barramundi be the white fish equivalent to salmon? The answer is yes, it can. But there's a lot of work to do to realise this potential. So what have we changed in our business since uh, you know, undertaken the Nuffield journey? Well, uh, we've changed a lot of things. So uh, the farm on the right up there, so... That's been, our, that's been the farm that we've operated from for uh, you know, 23 years. And uh, last year, five days after returning, we got, uh, per we got uh, permission to buy the land adjacent and to build the, uh, this other Barramundi farm. So in uh, a four month period, we had a pretty busy period. We built the Australia's largest Barramundi farm in four months. So it was quite busy. Uh, so we've increased the scale of our operation. Uh, we've this year we established an advisory board and, em and employed a CEO, Nick, who's uh, joined us today to come along and barrack. Uh, we've set up uh, national, national branding, uh, national marketing capabilities. So pre prior to this, uh, in our business history, we hadn't really had any sales capacity. We've now got a marketing manager nationally who can talk to the supermarkets and to the restaurant you know, hotel groups and the like. And we've got actual chef salesmen who go out and work with chefs to promote our product and, and draw that product back through, the, uh, back through the wholesalers. So we're working on, on the marketing side of things. Uh, we've launched a world first Barramundi sashimi product line, uh, which we're, you know, we've spent a bit of time developing and it's just, uh, just hit, hitting the markets at the moment. So uh, that's pretty cool and we're getting some amazing feedback from the market around that. So that's really looking to target those high value niches that Australian product needs to achieve. And been a bit more active off farm. So uh, last last week I was down in Canberra meeting with uh, Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce to talk about you know things that can you know bottlenecks around the Northern Development Agenda and what we can do to work together with them on that. You know I'm you know proud part of the Northern Territory Seafood Council board uh, where uh, you know we're instituting major change and obviously supporting the new national peak body to uh, you know to, to put you pursue country of origin labelling and, uh, you know, industry priorities. So, thank you. I'm done.